sing it out. I give it to have other people corrupted in this world. I told you, I said, I'm going to try and be brief. But I will share something very important with you that you will never forget for the rest of your life. The weapons of our warfare. That's what we call the armor of God. Weapons are armor. Weapons are armor. They are what a believer put on or carry along in the place of battle. Ephesians chapter number 6 from verse 10. The Bible said, Finally, my brethren, put on Ephesians chapter number 6 and verse 10. He said, Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Then he said, Take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the evil days. Take unto you the whole armor, armor of God. Finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Move on. Move on. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh or blood and blood, but against principalities and against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Verse 13. Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil days. And have it done all, he said, to stand. So what is the armor of God? And we understand already that armor means weapon. What is the armor of God? And if we have armor of God, it also means that there is an armor of Satan. There is an armor that belongs to the devil. Are you hearing me? Always counter what belongs to God. If God has an armor. Satan also has his own armor. The Bible said, our war is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Our opening scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, 2 Corinthians 10, sorry, verses 3. He said, though we walk in the flesh, we do not walk the ordinary war. We do not walk after the flesh. He said, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. He said, but they are mighty to God to the pulling down of struggle. Hallelujah. There are two kinds of spiritual uh, there are two kinds of spiritual weapons of warfare that a believer has. One is found in the book of Ephesians chapter number 6 from verses 14. Let's start from verse 13. Chapter number 6 from verses 13. He said, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the day of evil, and having done all to stand. Next. He said, Stand therefore, having your Louis guide about with truth. Was you are born again, one of the weapons of warfare that is required that you carry is the ability to live in truth. Ability to eradicate lies. The Bible said that is your loins. Pay attention. Truth unifies everything else. Truth bound up everything else that a believer has with God. The word loins, loins simply means your waist. Alright? To be guided about. The word guide is the, another word for gerdo. Gerdo, like belt. To put on belt. Truth is the belt that you are wearing in your waist. Are you hearing me? Truth is the belt. Put it on, please. Put it on. Truth is the belt that you are wearing in your waist. Next verse. Truth 
is the best. Every other weapons are useless when the belt is not there. If I'm dressed up now and no belt, this trouser will show it fall away or it will fall a little bit downward. There will be no proper fitness. If I'm dressing up right now and then there is no belt, sure, I won't be able to talk in this big sleeve I'm wearing. I won't. It will lose. When a believer is born again, I still live of lies. Whatever you have, whatever you have cannot stay. It cannot rest on you. Whether the gift of the spirit, whether you can prophesy, whether you can see vision, whether you can sing, whether you can pray, that gift will not find value. It will not find expression. It will not find a firm grip on your life. Except you live a life of truth. Alright? That verse, next verse, please. Verse 15. He said, And your feet shoot with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The shoe you are wearing on is your to tell about Jesus to the world. Ability to preach, to evangelize. I can guarantee you that from week to week, month to month, some of you will forget the fact that you are a child of God, talking less of preaching or talking about God to people that you meet in your affairs of life or in your day-to-day -day life. Some of you forget that you are a Christian, talking less of evangelizing Jesus to the people that comes to the affairs of your life. The Bible said that the shoes you are wearing, it said that your Food with the preparation of the gospel of peace. One of the reasons why your leg can't take you wrong places is because you are spending it in the place of God. Any part of you that you wholeheartedly and completely give unto God gains complete protection from the Lord. Can I repeat that? Anything that you give up to God will gain complete pro protection. Are you hearing me? A person with shoe, you don't expect that person to be quickly injured. Where there is no evangelism, you don't speak of Jesus to the people. You expose yourself. You expose your feet. Humanity to danger. Once you are a child of God. Next verse please. Just quickly, quickly. Verse 16. And above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. The word faith is a shield that protects the heart. Faith. A child of God must have faith. Faith is a shield. Do you know shield? What they used to block when they are fighting. That's what they call shield. When they are doing this sword battle. That thing they used to block. It's called shield. It's called shield. Upper. The Bible said your faith equals your shield. One of the reasons anything gets to you or anything gets at you, anything gets into you or anything gets at you is because there is bankruptcy of faith in your own end. There is bankruptcy of faith in your end. And it exposes you to the place where any kinds of arrow may be able to get at you. Let me ask your neighbor, do you have faith in God? If you hear God, gives you an instruction right now. Let's say for instance, God said, your first son, I need him to be my own. Will you be able to do it? To sacrifice him? Can you do it? You can't. <laughs> you can't. <laughs> You can't. That is where Abraham was able to stand at. The only begotten son. God said sacrifice him. The Bible said he did it. And he stood up. Until your faith start making you act as though you are not normal. Your faith is still not validated. You have faith. You are normal. Faith. When it comes to the things of God, you first do calculation. 
you calculate yourself, you calculate your mind, you calculate this, you calculate that. It's an issue of faithlessness that is playing out in that environment. It's an issue of faithlessness. Just told the young man that came to him, he said, sell all that you have. Give it to the poor. Come and follow me empty. Praise God. The young man, the Bible said, became sad because he was very wealthy. His wealth has developed to become his God. He didn't do it. He didn't do it. Faith. Hallelujah. The young man couldn't do it because of his level of faith that he has in God. Your faith is not just only to come to church and lift up your hands. There must be a demonstration of it. God must put you to the test. He must stretch you. And by stretching you, then your faith will be well defined. Your faith will be well proven. And the Bible said the shield of faith. The shield of faith. It's okay. It's okay. Next verse. The shield of faith. Quickly. We have looked at truth. As the guide. Alright. Verse 17. He said, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Helmet of salvation. Once you are born again, there is a crown, there's a, a there's a covering on your head that that exonerates you from the plots of the devil and from the schemes of the forces of darkness. But the question is, are you born again? Do you have salvation? When you confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, is it because you just wanted to say it, or you want you wanted to please the pastor that called you out on that altar call, or is it because your heart was pricked by God and you wanted to really surrender and submitted yourself to him. It's called the helmet of salvation. If you really have salvation, your head is secure. Then, your offensive weapon includes the word of God. The word of God must be in your mouth to have a complete armory on yourself as a believer. You don't have the word of God, you don't know the Bible, and you don't care. You know Facebook, you know WhatsApp, you know other things. But when it comes to the word, you don't know it. You know the name of all the comedians and all the actors and all their movie and the latest movie and the one they just acted that they have not released. But you don't know the word of God. God was in Christ reconciling the word to himself. And he has committed unto us the ministry of reconciliation. If I ask one person, one person here, to show me where that is in the Bible, who can? What I just quoted. Tell me the scripture and the verse. Who can? Who can? Until one start craving for God. For the word. For studying of the word. Getting accosted and addicted to the world. You have no power in you. What can you use to drive the devil back? The seven sons of Sceva in the book of Acts chapter 19. They brought out a man that has a demon. They said, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preach, we adore you to come out from him. And the man said, Jesus Christ, we just, we just, that you just mentioned with your man. I know him. Paul, that you just mentioned. I know him. Who are you? You where they talk. Who are you? There are many of us shouting Jesus' name in the church. But the word is not in us. So the words became, become powerless. Because the word is not in us. In the book of Hebrews, chapter number 4, verse 12. The Bible said the word of God is quick and powerful. Sharper than any two-edged sword. 
according to the dividing of the asunder, the joint between the marrows and the bone, and is the designer of the thoughts and intents of the hearts. The word of God, the Bible said, is as a two edged sword, sharper than it. Sword where they shall for this side, they shall for this side. He said, The word of God is quick and powerful, and then it's sharper. Sword don't have to be powerful, but the word of God has power. Then, number two, it has the capacity to be sharp to cut off anything that does not align with God around you and within you. Are you still there, church? Are you still there, church? And yet, people don't go for this word. They don't go for this word. They go for something else. I told you I was in a meeting when a pastor was saying, can I prophesy? And everybody shall prophesy. I said, should I prophesy or should I preach? And the people said, let him prophesy. And the prophecy does not have the capacity to cause their spiritual growth or sustainability. It doesn't. How many of you believe how many of you believe that I'm a prophet in this house? How many of you believe that I do see things? Huh? How many of you believe that I do see things that come to pass? Now, if a man of God with such capacity and calling is telling you that prophecy is nothing like your addiction to the world, then you should believe the world is your weapon in this battlefield that we are in. If you have a weapon, they cut you easily. They take you down easily. You don't have the word. And most of our world, except John 3.16 that they taught you in primary school. That's all. John 3.16. Some people now don't even know John 3.16. I can bet you. You can ask John 3.16 some people. They don't know it. For God so loved, that's the, the most the most common scripture in the whole world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe in him should not perish. <laughs> Finish. 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 One must have the word. Tell your neighbor, say you must have the word. Now, these are the weapons that form up the Christian or the armor of God. The armor of God. When you say you have the armor of God, this, when these things are in you, truth, faith, Preaching of the gospel, that's evangelism. Um, faith, the word of God. When they are with you, your armor is complete. You are now prepared as a spiritual instrument in the hand of the maker. There is another kind of weapon that the believer have. After saying this, I will tell you the weapons of the enemy that they are using against you. And I will show you how they use it. The believer have the capacity to transfer the power of God into physical things. A, there, are, there could be physical things that could be used as a correlation of spiritual power in the life of the believer. How do I say it again? In that book of Acts chapter number 19, we are told that people took the apron from Paul the Apostle's body and kerchief. They took it from Paul and casted it on those that had demons. And the demons left them. And kerchief. Alright? And those that have demons, the demons left. They cried. They fell under the anointing. The demons left because of an handkerchief that was taken. Where I went to preach one year like that in upper mission, there's a woman that invited me to come and preach. While I was preaching in the church, the Lord told me, He said, There is resistance in this church. There's one brand suit. That suit was almost customized to me. I can wear that suit three, that's 365 days a year. How many of you remember that suit? One brand thick suit. One my year, eh? Oh, God. <laughs> A suit in it. If you wear it, you don't get power. You don't feel waka. It is heavy. I wear that suit go. I press some iron now. While I was preaching, the Lord told me, said, take off that suit. I took it off. 
He said, cast it to the crowd. Both pastor, pastor, husband, because now woman get the church. The, hus the man that was with her, an all member. I was now looking for who to preach to. They were all on the floor. Are you hearing me? They were all on the ground manifesting. Why? Because the power has rested and they should become what we call the conduit of power. Boom! The power was released. Are you, are you see there? So there could be conduit of power. There could be conduit of power. Sometime it can be on the handkerchief. This is one of the reasons I don't take my time to stand on this altar and start condemning this pastor, that pastor, this fake pastor. And I, I, I wonder how some men of God who have attained some spiritual status could just carry the assignment of coming to condemn pastors and what they do. If you don't know them, do what you do. Do, do, your, do your best. Use your best to set example. It's people that see you and what you do that will say, ah, this man of God doesn't do this, doesn't do that, yet God is with him. You do your best and stop fighting against Christianity. There are pastors that are fighting Christianity now. They'll just bring this pastor. This pastor matter. They will speak and speak and speak. They'll bring the other pastor. They'll speak and speak and speak. I don't spend my time doing that. God have trained me not to be doing that. Right from time. Are you sitting here, church? Now, look, look at me. There could be conduit of power. One can pray on water. And release it. Power will flow. In the book of John, Jesus spoke. Jesus spat on, on soil. John chapter 9. And used it to anoint the eye of the man that has no eye. And the man came back seeing. He didn't only anoint it. He told himself, go to the pool called the pool of Shiloh. That's the same pool where angels go to stir up the water. He said, go and wash there. He said, you will see. The man did and he saw. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? What if I tell you that in the book of Mark chapter 8, Jesus Christ spat on the tongue of one man. He poured spit, put on somebody's mouth. Twer, twer. What if I tell you that? Jesus did it. The man was dumb and deaf. And he came back hearing and seeing. The Bible said he took him into the outskirts of the town and spat into his tongue. The man came back hearing and seeing. Listen to me. A prophet or a child of God has made himself an instrument in the hand of God. Instrument of war, instrument of battle, instrument of liberation in the hand of God. So one must be careful, one must be sensitive to the things you assume so that you don't fall into the state of blasphemer or into the position of a blasphemer and so that you don't receive the cause of a blasphemer upon yourself. What we call the conduit of power. This is the second weapon that a believer has. The weapons of our warfare. The weapons of our warfare. Sometimes, having prayed for long, I'll hear the voice of God. Having prayed for some time, I hear the voice of God tell me, do this, do that, do this, do that. Sometimes the Lord could tell me that this thing that you have been praying about is in the roof of this house. Look for a way. Release anointing on the roof. It will, it will cause the power to expire. Sometimes God could tell me, I told you, I said I entered one man's house at uh, Airport Road. And as I was crossing the door, I saw Cham buried on the ground. Sometimes God was say, release and release an anointing on that on that floor. Release it and make it a point of contact to the things that are buried there, and they will lose their power. Your anointing oil can be the conduit of power. The handkerchief, the anything mantle that God gives you. It can be a conduit of power, but be sure that God is involved in it. All right, it can be a conduit of power. Then your seed, your seed. I want to believe that a lot of people think that giving is to do God favor or the man of God favor or the tithe 
that you pay or the offering that you give or the seed that you sow you believe that you are using it to do man of God favor not be so a lot of people believe like that they do not know their seed their offering could be the weapons could be their own weapons of warfare your seed or shout your seed in Judges chapter number 6 can I preach this gospel this is, the, this is the, the secret I said I will show you you have heard me preach about the weapon uh, the armor of God before but this is the physical correlation of your spiritual weapon the conduit of power Judges chapter number 6. I've told this message maybe over 50 times in this church. About Gideon and the family. How they had an altar in their house. You remember? And that altar made them suffer many things. Then in verse 25. Let's just move over to verse 25. God came by night and spoke to Gideon. He said, throw down the altar of Baal that your father have. You know what? There's an altar that is in your father's house. That is causing the problem that you are, all of you are going through. He said, when you get to home, go and destroy that altar. He said, but as you are destroying the altar, put it on screen. Judges 6.25. As you are destroying the altar, he said, take your father's young bullock. The bullock is seven years. Are you still with me? The bullock, sir, is seven years old. Their problem has lasted for seven years. If you go back to verse 1, Judges chapter 6 verse 1, the Bible said that Israel committed sin against God. They did evil in the sight of the Lord and God was not happy. God gave them up to the Midianites for seven good years. They were tortured by the Midianites. Now in verse 25 here, the Bible said God told Gideon, he said, and it came to pass the same night, that the Lord said unto him, take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old. Go to verse 1. Quickly, and then you come back to verse 25. Go to verse 1. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the mid of Midian. How many years? Then in verse 25, God told Gideon, He said, Take your father's young bullock, the one that has lasted seven years. He said, throw down the grove that is on the altar and offer, throw down the grove that is in the house. Throw down the, the, the image of Baal, the altar of Baal. And he said, offer this sacrifice to me on the other place where you are raising the altar. Be looking at the Bible. Where you are raising the altar. He said, raise an altar. Offer this seven years old bullock. Offer it to me in that place. Or say, seven years old bullock. For seven years old captivity. We are not done. We'll move to verses. That's in Judges chapter 6. We are going to look at verses. Okay. Judges chapter number 6. We are looking from verse 14. From verse 14. After an angel came to Gideon. And the angel started talking to Gideon. Telling Gideon that God was with him. You know he's going to smite the Midianites as one man. Long story cut short. Verse 17. Gideon said to the angel. Are you, are you with me in this church at all? And he said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, then show me a sign that thou talkest, talkest with me. Gideon was not telling angel, If I'm talking to you, if you are an angel of the Lord, give me a sign that you are the one that I'm talking to. Verse 18. He said, Depart not hence, I pray thee, till I come unto thee, and bring forth my present, and set it before thee. 
And he said, I will tarry until thou come. And Gideon went in and made ready a, a kid. Please, don't, don't joke with this particular verse I'm, I'm showing you now. Made ready a kid and an unliving cake of an ephah of flour. The flesh he put in a basket. Unliving what? Unliving what? What did, he, what did he make, please? Church, what did he make? He made an unliving cake. God help me in upper. Praise God. Verse 19. And Gideon went in and made ready a kid and unliving cake of an ephah of flour. The flesh he put in a basket and he put the brute in a pot and brought it out unto him under the oak and presented it. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Take the flesh and the living cake and lay it upon the rock, upon this rock, and pour out the brute. And he did so. And the angel of the Lord put forth the end of the staff that was in his hand and took flesh and the living cakes. And there rose of fire out of the rock and consumed the flesh and the living cakes. Then the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. He gave angel cakes to eat. The Bible said when he brought the cake, he brought it in a basket. Then the angel said, no, put it on the, bring them, put them, let them touch the rock. He brought them, um, they, they touched the rock. Then the wine also. The angel said, pour it on the rock. He poured it. And the angel used the staff that was in his hand to touch it. Fire came out. The angel followed the fire and disappeared. When Gideon saw it, Gideon screamed. Say, I've seen an angel of the Lord face to face. Are you there? Now, let's go to chapter number 7. Chapter 7. Because of time. Chapter number 7. Let's start from verse 12. And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the children of the east lay along in the valley of grasshoppers for multitude. Like grasshopper for multitude, sorry. And their garments were without number. As the sun by the side by the seaside for multitude. And when the Gideon was come, behold, there was a man that told a dream unto his fellow. And said, Behold, I dream a dream. And lo, a cake of barley. A cake of what? What did Gideon give to the angel? Huh? What did he give to the angel? What appeared in this man's dream? A cake of barley. Of barley bread. Have you found it? He said, Tumbled into the host of Midian and came unto a tent and smote it as it fell and, over, and overturned it that the tent lay along. And his fellow answered and said, This is nothing else save the sword of Gideon, the son of, of Joash, a man of Israel. For into his hand had God delivered Midian and all his souls. With those and say, Thank you. The young man by name Gideon, the Bible said, An angel of the Lord told him, He said, God is going to use you to end the battle that is in the land of the Abyss, right? is in your father's house God is going to use you to end the battle the bible said that God told Gideon he said he's going to use you as one man to end the entire war that the Midianites brought against your people the young man was confused and he said to the angel if you know that you are really an angel he said wait for me so the young man ran inside baked a cake of barley along with wine the bible said that the angel of the lord told him he said put the cake on this rock he put the cake he said pour the wine he poured the wine so the angel took a staff the staff that was in his hand he used it to touch the cake and the bible said fire came out and the angel went in the midst of the fire i don't know if you're understanding me 
Now in chapter 7, the enemies that gathered, there were so many that the Bible called them grasshopper. There were so many for multitude. The Bible said that they looked like the sand by the side of the sea. There were so many, but one of them called his neighbor. He said, come, come, come. We all gather here. We are about to fight. Last night, I saw a dream. In my dream, I saw a cake that was tumbling. This cake was rolling. The cake has become giant in the spirit. The cake was rolling. He said the cake hit the tent. The tent where the Midianites was gathered. The cake brought the tent down. The tent was destroyed. He said the tent was laid alongside as the cake came upon it. And then his friend said, listen, this cake you saw. It's not cake, but it is the sword of Gideon. A man gave out cake. If he was the, the friend called it a sword, he gave out cake as a seed. He gave it out as a sacrifice, but it appeared like a weapon of warfare in the realm of the spirit. You have a long time battle in your life. You have something that is not going away. You have a long time challenge that is in your life, in your heart. You thought you have been praying. You thought you have been fasting. So there is something that is with you. Are you hearing me? That you have not made use of. There is something that God has given to you that you have not yet made use of. You are afraid that if you let go of this, or if you do this, or if you do that, you may lose it all. But that may become the actual weapon that can end your battle. A man gave cake. Cake appeared in the camp of the enemy and destroyed their and destroy their thing. Listen to me. My prayer for you today. The name of Jesus Christ that is in your life. It shall crumble the thoughts of your enemy. Their hold. Their ground against you. Their bulwark. Their siege against you. I command them to crumble in the name of the Lord Jesus. By your sacrifice and your offering. Every forces of darkness. That seem to be in conflict with your life. That seem to be in conflict with the purpose and the programs of God for your life. If I'm hearing a loud amen, it shall come to an end. Oh, say you have a weapon of warfare. You have the weapon of warfare. You have the weapon of warfare. Listen! The anki that I used to clean my sweat. Now, this sweat is the product of the anointing, the power of God with which I do the work. If I cast it to you, you, you should, if you see it as an ordinary anki, it can never work for you. But if you take it as mantle of faith, then you begin to see the results. There are a lot of people outside that are coming, that are coming with testimony over the prayers and little things with a little encounter. Just like normal, I prayed for an olive oil and gave to a woman. But because she have an extraordinary faith on it, she gave to her son. The boy poop nylon cord, strong nylon cord. They tie it here. They, they will still pull it. You see another place where they tie strong nylon cord out of his anus. Out of his anus. The brother that I gave an oil, that one played the video. You all saw it here. Took the oil that I prayed on. As he drank, he pooped stones. Out of his anus. Many of you saw that video here. Stones! Stones! We are inside someone's belly. Stones! This is not 100 years ago. It's about 2 or 3 years ago that this happened. Why? Because he saw what was given to him as weapon. One of the reasons that enemy is not yet gone is because you don't know the weapon that God has given to you. God said to Moses in Exodus chapter number 14. He said, what is in your hand. There are there are some things God can use, sir. Ma, he can turn it against your enemy, the enemy that stayed too long over your life, resisting your breakthrough. There are things that we know. I know, I know that God can use to bring them down. I'm gonna pray for you right now because the enemy have things that also belong to them in your life. I, I, I'll quickly show you that, then I'll pray. And I'll prophesy. The book of Luke, chapter 11, verse 21. The Bible said, when a strong man arm keeps his palace, he said, his goods are in peace. 
What people didn't, what a lot of people don't see there is the arm, arm, a r o a r o m. When a strong man arm keepeth his palace, the Bible said his goods are in peace. Luke eleven twenty one. Are you there? Have you found it? When a strong man armed. Now, this strong man, the Bible said when he's armed and then he keep his palace, he said his goose are in peace. Until a man that is stronger come upon him and overcome him and take away the armor that he trusted upon. That man will continue to maintain his position over that place where he poses as a king. Where he poses over you. The strong man in this contest is the devil. The strong man in this contest is the wicked one. When they invade your life, as long as they are goose, because the, oh, shit. the Bible said when he's armed, then invade your life. He will stay there permanently. No deliverance for that person. If you invade your life with headache, no matter the drug you take, it will not work. Others will take the same drug. It will work for them. Over the same thing. But when it comes to you, it will not work. Others may be faced with the same problem that look like yours. But when it comes to you, no solution. Why? Because a strong man is involved. What gives the strong man ground? Number one, the Bible said he's armed. Is armed. Remember, I told you, I said I will, I will also share with you the armor of the strong man. The word arm is the abbreviation for armor. 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 The man is carrying a weapon. The man has access over you. The man has power. And this power, you are the one that gave it. This power, you are the one that gave him. You are the one that gave him. You are the one that gave him the right to your life. You are the one that gave him the assets to that power. It's what he's using against you now. The absence of the armor of God is the armor of Satan. Let me explain. If truth, if truth is the sword of the spirit, it means lie. A Christian that lies, a Christian that lies, have no sword to, to, counter, to counteract the enemy when they are coming. And then the enemy will have his way. If fight is the shield, shield, with which you block the fiery dart of the wicked, faithlessness removes the shield from you. You are gradually being exposed. Alright? If righteousness is the helmet, I'm sorry, if, if righteousness is your uh, what's it breastplate, the breastplate of righteousness, it means when you are living a life of impurity and unfaithfulness, you are exposing yourself to be attacked. You are exposing your chest because righteousness protects the heart. It's a breastplate. You wear it as a breastplate. When it is not there, sir, you expose your heart to be attacked. You expose your heart to be demonized. Are you hearing me? The opposite or the deficiencies of the armor of God give the strong man's armor. So the Bible said, when a stronger than him shall come, the only way you can be rescued, if the strong man is the one that have a hand over your case, the only way you can be rescued is when a stronger than him come upon him. Who is the stronger than him? God Almighty. When a stronger than him come upon him. Who is the stronger than him? Jesus Christ. And the first thing Jesus does, the Bible said, he will take away, he take away, he said, when, he said, when a stronger than he shall come upon me, him and overcome him, he take away the armor wherein he trusted. That thing that gave him the edge of confidence over you, Jesus will remove it. 